see where things go from here. But obviously, the trade tensions between China and the U.S. weighing heavily on the market to start the week. And this comes as President Trump weighed in on the trade tensions earlier today. He took to Twitter to tweet saying, quote, China dropped the price of their currency to an almost historic low. It's called currency manipulation. Are you listening, Federal Reserve? This is a major violation which will greatly weaken China over time. So joining us to discuss this now is Milken Institute chief economist William Lee. Uh, and William, I'd like to get your thoughts on what the president said there as he lays it out. Currency manipulation, is that really what's going on here? Well, it's clearly China's policy to let the markets determine where the exchange rate is. And the market's been pushing the renminbi weaker and weaker. The policy move comes in how they did it. They let it overnight jump by almost 290 bits, and that's quite a bit in one night. They've been gradually letting this go, but now that they actually did it in one night, it's almost a statement that says, you know, you slap tariffs on us, we're going to offset it, and we're going to allow the exchange rate to offset it. So that that is, uh, is, is raising the policy tensions between the U.S. and China considerably. Yeah, it's almost as if they wanted the biggest market move. They wanted the U.S. to feel the pain that they're feeling here, but President Trump also expanded on it here, saying that based on the historic currency manipulation by China, it is now even more obvious to everyone that Americans are not paying for the tariffs. They are being paid for compliments of China, and the U.S. is taking in tens of billions of dollars. China has always used currency manipulation to steal our businesses and factories, hurt our jobs, depress our workers' wages, and harm our farmers' prices. Not anymore. What's the potential impact if these tariffs go through, though, is the question we're asking today. And obviously, we should lay out here that that's not the case. We've highlighted on the show how tariffs work. We know that the producers and manufacturers pass prices, uh, price increases along to consumers. But I'd be very curious to get your thought on kind of how this plays out now that the Chinese have made their move and Trump still weighing, potentially increasing the tariffs applied to Chinese goods. One of the things that economists have gotten wrong has been the timing of how these price increases have taken place. Uh, the textbooks say that as soon as you slap a tariff on, the consumers are going to have to pay essentially the full brunt of the tariffs. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really seen that. Uh, the, the, if you look at the price of imported goods, they really haven't increased that much. And now that the renminbi has been devalued, there's less pressure to increase prices. So one of the things that we have to be very careful about is the timing of these price increases. Yes, American importers cut the check to pay for the tariffs, no question about it. But now what do the American importers do? Do they force the Chinese supplier to absorb some of that? Do they force some of the American suppliers to absorb some of that? Walmart's profit margins shrink? Or is it that ultimately the consumer bears all of it? And that's the unknown question. And that's something that we have struggled with trying to estimate. And the, the best estimates I've seen are come out of Germany of all places, because they really have a very detailed model of how these things work. And they estimate that 70% of the tariff burden ultimately falls on the Chinese. So there's a lot of controversy here, but nevertheless, it's very true. American importers cut the check to pay the tariffs. What happens afterward is what the debate is all about. Mm -hmm. Hey, William, Brian Chung here. So China has said that it doesn't want to weaponize the currency. So I guess my first question is, would you describe them actually letting market forces take the USD to Chinese Yuan to above seven? Would you describe that as weaponization? And if not, what would be proper weaponization? Would that be something like playing with uh, their current holdings of US treasuries, for example? If they really want to weaponize, right, then you're absolutely right. They would be much more aggressive in pushing that exchange rate. Uh, and, and I think what they've done, as I said, overnight has been to show that they can weaponize and to the extent that we didn't even imagine before, that they can let the exchange rate go. Now, one of the things that they have to struggle with is if they do let the exchange rate go, their domestic residents that are holding, uh, you know, Roman Bay assets are going to say, my God, this stuff is worth less relative to other global assets. So there's going to be a massive capital outflow, and that's what they were afraid of in 2015 uh, that caused them to really stop weaponizing the exchange rate. And that's the thing that China is struggling with, is that they want the renminbi to be a global, national, and global currency that people use for trade all over the place. Right? The internationalization of renminbi has been a policy for the Chinese for decades. If they actually weaponize it, it'll turn against that policy and turn the renminbi into a national uh, local currency, and that's exactly not what they don't want. Hi, this is uh, Carlton English. Going back to uh, Trump's tweet from earlier today about how he called out the Federal Reserve, um, how do you see you know this renewed tariff tension? You know, actually possibly forcing a rate cut. Um, earlier today, you know, it seemed almost certain that there's going to be some sort of cut coming in September. With some saying even that 50 basis point cut people were hoping for is on the table. You know, this is like a kabuki dance between uh, Powell <laughs> and Trump. 
Um, you know, in, in all the press conferences, Chair Powell has been saying trade tensions and trade uncertainty has raised the level of, of drag on the global economy, and that is going to influence how we look at the U.S. economy. And then Trump essentially has said, all right, you think trade uncertainty is what's going to get you to move your interest rates? I'm going to give you more of it. <laughs> and 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 so so I think um, what President Trump is really trying to do is to get the rates down on the short end mm -hmm. because uh, that is what the, U the the Federal Reserve can control. But also remember the long end, the 10-year Treasury, the 30-year Treasury is dropped down to the 170s now um, because the global interest rates are also incredibly low. I mean, we have Europe and Japan negative rate territory. We have about 14 trillion dollars worth of assets with negative yield so the u.s having such high uh long-term rates is incompatible and really uh, misaligned with the global economy and it, the long rate really has to come down or or the dollar has to appreciate like crazy which is something that not nobody wants but i mean when we're looking at this right i mean uh, you're laying it out there and we're just taking a look at the 10-year now down to 1.73 but when you look at it uh i mean where do we go from here? Because you're laying it out the way that President Donald Trump wants this to play out. You're talking about how he's gotten the rate cut he was looking for. You're talking about the brunt of the tariffs being applied, at least in the data you were pointing to there, uh, being felt by the Chinese producers. So, I mean, when you look at this, I mean, he's got the election in 2020, but are you saying that President Trump is playing this exactly how he should be playing it when you look at a trade war? From a political perspective, it's in uh, President Trump's interest to delay the agreement until the time of the uh, of the election, because mm -hmm. he wants to bring home a victory right just before the election. Sure. The victory for him is going to be defined as more ag purchases and more industrial goods. All the stuff about um, about intellectual property and, and 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 market access is something that essentially helps the California uh, uh, economy, right? Because it's uh, it's Silicon Valley that benefits most from that. And let's face it, he's not likely going to get California in his electoral basket. So <laughs> so for for from a political strategy point of view, he'll delay the hard items until after the election if he gets reelected, mm -hmm. um, and 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 he's hoping to bring in the quick short-term victories in ag and industrial products that will help him with Ohio and the farmers. Sure, sure. So time that out to right before you get to 2020. But on the flip side, I mean, when we're talking about the consumer pain being felt here, a lot of the tariffs haven't really hit those consumer-facing products. And that's going to be pain, at least in the short term, if these go into effect in September, as the president has talked about. So, I mean, in your mind, maybe the time to apply this, the pressure would be right now. So jumping from, he said, 10 percent, it could go up to 20. Right now, in your mind, are you expecting that? And if you are... Uh, what kind of market reaction could play out if finally the consumer sentiment is finally dented? The consumer sentiment right now has been holding up strong because he, the, essentially the data have not shown these price increases to affect the ultimate consumer. It's hit everybody in between, right. but not the consumer right. yet. And that's why the consumption uh, is, is so strong in the economy. When everyone says we don't need a rate increase, they're all referring to the consumer. But if you look at where the future of GDP, I'm a, I've been a forecaster my entire professional life. And one of the things we always look at is where's investment going? Because investment determines future hiring, future productivity, and future real wages and real incomes investment is crashing, not only in the United States, but around the world. So that's the thing that I am most concerned with. And that's why uh, I and other people of this, of, who are in the forecasting game are very concerned that we need to have a policy backstop to reassure confidence uh, among producers and, and investors that we need CapEx and we need it now and it's safe to do it now. That's something the Fed has failed to do to say that we're there to back up the economy no matter what. Right? He did, Chair Powell has not come out with a draggy, we'll do everything it takes to backstop the economy. And if he were to do that, I think we would have much more solid growth going forward. All right, there you go. William Lee laying out the case for Jerome Powell to step up a little bit stronger. Thank you so much for taking the time. Appreciate you weighing in with us, sir.